Hello, everyone. Um, it is wonderful to be here. My name is Troy McKenzie. I'm the dean of the law school, and it is uh, great to be here for our second Life of the Law event. Um, as you know, this is a unique opportunity to see the story behind the story, and we're going to be joined by the fantastic Joshua Prager, who is a reporter and someone who has interests in the law that are a little different from the way most lawyers approach uh, the law. Uh, Joshua is a former senior writer for the Wall Street Journal and has written about historical secrets and the uncovered stories in many different areas. Um, he wrote a phenomenal work about Bobby Thompson's shot heard around the world for the baseball fans. Um, and he also wrote a book, The Family Row, which is about the untold story of the people behind Roe v. Wade and um, revealed for the first time glimpses of the abortion debate through the lives of those who were involved in the litigation. The book was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. In the fall, at the first Life of the Law event, he led us through a fascinating discussion with plaintiffs, they were then children, in major religion cases, Engel against Vitali in the 1960s, and the Yoder case in the 1970s, uh, with uh, children who had been plaintiffs as part of the litigation. Um, this evening, he is going to be leading us in a discussion about um, a landmark Supreme Court case, Bostock against Clayton County. And he's going to be um, interviewing and discussing that case with the named plaintiff in the case, who is with us this evening, Gerald Bostock. Um, I also want to acknowledge the very generous support of Christopher Buck, who is the founder of Retro Report, which is a news organization that combines documentary journalism with history and civics education. His support has been incredibly important to making this happen this evening. So I will sit down, be quiet, and listen to the conversation. Thank you, Dean McKenzie, very much. It's an honor to be here, and uh, just um, excited to be here with all of you, um, and very excited to be here with you, Gerald. Um, as you mentioned, um, you know I'm I'm not a lawyer. I majored in music theory in college, and um, when I have questions about the law, I turn to my friends like um, uh, Judge Furman, who's sitting right here, and he answers them for me. Um, and what I'm more comfortable doing is sort of looking at the people behind these famous, famous cases that have informed our society. Um, and I was very excited that you were available uh, to join us. Your story is fascinating and, um, and interesting and important and I think offers um, sort of clues to, um, you know, the courage that it took to become uh, the plaintiff in this case. So let's sort of start at the beginning. Um, you were born in 1964. You grew up in Valdosta, Georgia. I asked you just a little bit about the town. You said basically football and church. These were the sort of two pillars. Um, tell us a little bit about your family and a little bit about what it was like to grow up there. Sure. Uh, as many of you may have watched in the past, I believe there was a TV series known as Friday Night Lights. Well, I literally grew up in that kind of atmosphere. And for those of you that know South Georgia, you know that concept very well because it's considered to be one of the top high school football areas in our country. And yes, definitely growing up in that environment, we, we were taught very early on the three Fs. There's faith, there's family, and you got it, there's football. <laughs> So that, that has stuck with me throughout my early years, my formative years, and I, I truly believe helped formed me to be 
the man that I've become today. And trust me when I say I'm proud of who I am, I'm proud of what I've accomplished, and I have not let anyone take that away from me, as you will hear tonight. So, so um, for college, you stayed close to home, uh, Valdosta State, right? That is correct. And um, you joined a fraternity there. You um, uh, declared a major in sociology. And, um, and you graduated in 1987. A college advisor really kind of helped steer you into your life um, as a social worker. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you made the decision to enter that world and what it was that she said to you and how she influenced you and helped you um, choose that, that job? You're right, Josh. Uh, Annette Copeland was my advisor, and bless her heart, I know I probably caused her to get a lot of gray hair because as I entered college and was going through the, the core basics, she kept on me about, you need to decide a major. And I was clueless. I, I did not know what I wanted to do. I, I didn't know how I was going to do it. And she kept pressuring me. And finally, I said, OK, business. Most of my friends were in the business program. So I, I ended up doing that. And as I started taking some of those courses, I realized very quickly on that that was not for me. And I had met with her, maybe it was like a Friday afternoon, and she said, OK, I know you're not happy with what you've selected, and I'm going to give you until Monday. And you need to really think this weekend about what you want to do and what kind of impact you want to make on this world. And oddly enough, I, over the weekend, I watched this movie. And it was about a group home that was responsible for foster children that had come into the system through no fault of their own. And they were removed from their parents' care. And they got placed by the juvenile court in this particular group home. And the movie focused on one of the social workers that worked directly with these children. And that was it. The lights came on. I said, I cannot wait to see my advisor come Monday morning. So of course, I proudly walked in her office and told her, I appreciate your support, and I want to go into social work, and I want to work with foster care youth. And much to my surprise, she said, no, you're not doing that. Hmm. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm, you just talked to me last week about making an impact and doing something that you will be happy doing. And I said, and this is it. And she said, well, I'm signing you up for medical sociology. She said, you will make so much more money in the medical field. You will not be happy. You will never earn a living working with foster children. And I, I fussed with her, and I gave her such a difficult time. And fortunately, she finally backed down, and I was enrolled in all of the social work classes and courses that directed me in that direction. And that's basically how I got my start and my love for working with underprivileged children and working with children that found themselves in a situation that they had no control over. It wasn't their fault. Uh, they had nothing to do with it. And then they were thrust in this chaotic child welfare system and I knew they needed help, they needed guidance, and they needed somebody that would be there that could understand and help push them through and eventually get them to adulthood. So over the coming decade, you worked with foster kids, you worked with um, at Child Protective Services, and you were essentially helping to give a voice to, to people who really didn't have one, people who weren't able to sort of speak for themselves. Um, and first, give us a sense of sort of in a practical way, a little bit about um, what, you, what you were doing for them sort of on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Well, initially, when I entered the child welfare system, I did start as a child protective um, social worker and provided services on the front end, handling investigations where there had been suspected or alleged abuse or neglect. 
And what's interesting, and probably a lot of people that aren't familiar with the child welfare system, what people don't realize is that those individuals that enter that field, they become more than just an employee of the county and the state. They become a lifeline to that child. They, meaning the, the social workers, they are protector, their friend. They are a policing agent. They are a sounding board. Oftentimes, they are one of the voices in the juvenile court process representing that child. And certainly, across this country, we know there are a lot of underpaid positions and occupations, but individuals in the social work, child advocacy field are most definitely underpaid for what is expected of them. When I started in Chatham County, I had a caseload of 60 children, which is unheard of. The, the county and state policy said we were not allowed to have more than 30, which was even then a ridiculous number. And we were required to make several visits and contacts with each child in our caseload. So we spent a lot of time just tracking down those kids that we were assigned to. But I did it because I had to do it for that child to make sure that that child was safe and was not going to face further abuse or return home to an abuser. Were your parents um, proud of you in your work? I think so. They were. Um, I, I, I asked that because one of the things that um, interested me is here I mentioned you know you're you're giving these young people a voice and there was a big part of you that you had sort of not spoken up of spoken up on behalf of um, and that was your being gay and you told me you were in your early 30s when you decided it's now time for me to come out to my parents 1997 um, how did they react and um, and what gave you the courage to finally do that it was not easy, uh, as for a lot of children and young adults. Um, my mother first found out, and my mother shut down. She, um, she made some very hateful statements and comments to me. Uh, she questioned my lifestyle, which for a brief period caused me to shut down. And I unfortunately didn't really have an opportunity to speak to my father more in depth about my chosen lifestyle. Um, because sadly, by 2000, my father had passed away with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it was at that time I was in a relationship and my partner at that time worked for Marriott and was transferred to Key West for a year. And something just clicked with me and said, this is it, this is the time that I live my true self, I live my life. Um, not that I'm gonna run down the street or run through the hallways carrying the rainbow flag, but I'm gonna be authentic to who I am and not hide. And if my mother doesn't like it, then she will either learn to accept it or, or not. Uh, that would be a decision that she would make. But interestingly, after, after the year and I, me and my partner at the time returned back to the Atlanta area. And again, this is after the passing of my father. We had that opportunity, my mother and I, to have some very serious conversation. And I was dumbfounded when she shared with me that my father had known all along. And truth be known, I'm sure my mother had some idea as well. But what was interesting to me was that my mother shared that my father basically told her, this is our son, it doesn't matter who he is with, who he loves, how he identifies, I don't care if he has purple hair, you know, three arms, two, two and a half feet, it doesn't matter, this is our son. And from that moment forward, my mother began to accept, I think after she was able to release that information mm -hmm. that she had actually kept from me for a couple of years. 
So we've had a lot of mending time, and, and I'm happy to say that our relationship is much better and, and much stronger now. Hmm. Well, there are a few things that are as profound or consequential, I guess, as the acceptance or really the rejection of a parent. So you, you then sort of found out not only, you now know not only had sort of your mother's acceptance, but you knew that your father had sort of accepted the fact that you were gay too. What kind of effect did that have on you? Um, uh, did, you did you choose then, for example, to be out at work or with, with others or how, did, it, did, it change, did it change you in some way? It did, Josh. I, I think it empowered me. Again, I, I made that decision to live my own life. And part of that did include being more outwardly public with my chosen lifestyle and the fact that, that I, I had a partner. And I had the opportunity to accept a position in Clayton County, Georgia, which is a, a South Atlanta metro county. And um, the position I accepted was the CASA program coordinator. And for those of you not familiar with CASA, it's the Court Appointed Special Advocates. And what that program does is it recruits individuals from the community to become CASA volunteers. Mm -hmm. And after a period of training, these volunteers would also serve as a voice for children during the juvenile court process if they had been removed due to child abuse or neglect. So when I accepted this position as part of my transition to this is who I am, again, not running the rainbow flag down every hallway and screaming it at the, the top of the roof, you know, I was very open about the fact that I had a male partner. We were not married, but we were in a relationship uh, almost 12 years at that point. We bought a home in the community, uh, Jonesboro, Georgia, which is a very small town within Clayton County, uh, right where the courthouse is located. And so I decided I wasn't gonna hide. And that's kind of when this journey started and when things started to change. Um, one of the individuals that eventually becoming our juvenile court director, after I had started with the county, he had approached me in kind of an aggressive manner and, and not so friendly. And he asked about, did I have a girlfriend? And I, I told him, no, I, I have a partner, and his name is. And he said, well, I, I knew that. All these girls you know, here at the court, they've been asking about you, were you single? And, and I knew that. I knew you were gay. And I, you know, I was like, OK, this probably isn't the best thing in the world, but OK. But I continued and kind of pushed that to the side and became the man that I am. And during that process, I continued to grow my program. The, the volunteers that we recruited to work with the child abuse and neglect victims that came into Clayton County, we actually set the benchmark of serving 100% of those children that came into care and custody, which no other Metro Atlanta program had been able to accomplish. And that's quite a feat. And that's quite a lot of children that came into our juvenile court system and the child welfare system in our community. And then again, new chapters happen and things start to change. Well, you mentioned this one person at work who was sort of confrontational and unpleasant. Were, were most of the folks at work like that, or did people sort of accept you, your bosses, your colleagues? Most everyone did. Most everyone didn't really care. And I did form a relationship early on with one of our juvenile court judges. Mm -hmm. um, he and his wife would invite me and my partner out to dinner. I was invited to his home in our community in Jonesboro 
for cookouts on Sunday. He and his family had a swimming pool in the backyard, and they would occasionally ask me and some of my friends, as a matter of fact, to come over um, on a Sunday or Saturday afternoon for a get-together. So I, I, other than the individual that eventually became the court administrator, I, I didn't really, I felt comfortable, I guess mm -hmm. is the best way to put it. I, I'm doing my job. I'm doing it well. We, we got state recognition for the hard work. We had na national recognition for all of the success we were having. So, yeah, I thought everything was going along fine. You were getting great reviews at work. Um, and um, so fast forward sort of a decade or so, you then have um, something scary happens in your life. 2012, you're, you're diagnosed with prostate cancer. Was it 2012? That is correct. And, um, you know, one of the amazing things, just sort of um, a testament to how devoted you were to work, you missed one day. Is that right? During my treatment, yeah. I went to work every single day except for the last day of treatment. I had to have five weeks of external radiation at one of our larger hospitals in Atlanta, which was about a 20, 25 minute drive, depending on traffic. Um, so I had that daily and I scheduled my treatment during my lunch hour. And fortunately, my circle in that community, not only friends, but coworkers, I never had to drive to my treatment appointments. Someone, they all took turns. So someone would take me, they would drop me off, I would, I would have my treatment, which was usually pretty quick, 15, 20 minutes. Then they would take me back to work. And granted, by the time five o'clock rolled around, I was tired, I was uh, ready to either go to bed or lay on the couch, uh, oftentimes, falling asleep, but I did it. I did it every day, except for the last day. I decided, damn it, I'm gonna take a day off. I'm <laughs> going to celebrate the fact that this part of my treatment was completed. I still had another phase of treatment. Within three or four weeks, I had to have a uh, seed implant procedure uh, conducted. I took a week off for the procedure and my program had a major fundraiser every year, and it happened to, that annually happened at the same, it was the last Saturday of every September. And after my week off, even though I was tired still, I was not feeling 100%, I went every day to work to not only accomplish the tasks that I needed to do for my job, but also make sure our fundraiser was put together. Um, and some of you may have seen or heard the duck derbies where they race the little rubber ducks. Well, our program created this huge race course in front of the courthouse lawn, and then we sold tickets, raffle tickets for the ducks that had numbers on them. So we had to build the, the race course, and then we had to actually have the day, the event, the race, which was also a community event where we had vendors and providers come in and you know, sell popcorn and do face painting for the kids and so forth, et cetera. And I was there every day for our fundraising efforts on top of doing the work that had piled up after the week being off from the implant procedure. And then you were obviously recovering nicely because in January of 2013, you joined a softball team. Um, so um, that kind of then really is the beginning of, of the end of your job um, because um, you joined the softball team in January. Um, I think you've got, is this the shirt from the team? Yeah. Well, we have several. Several teams? Yes. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> so you can, uh, yeah. What was the name of the team? I had joined the Honey Badgers. This was our front logo and the back, in my opinion. <laughs> Very appropriate, and yes, I was named Papi Chulo by my <laughs> teammates. Um, after this, if you want to ask why, I'll be glad to share that with you. But, uh, so yeah, I've got several, and we're going to talk specifically, I think, about one of these T-shirts. Well, but in March, you know, one of the things that you were so good at, you you enlisted endless kind of volunteers uh, to help out with 
uh, the kids and your work. And, um, and in March, you were recruiting some of your teammates, right? That to, is correct. Yeah. And then, well, tell us a little bit how you recruited them and then kind of what happened in April. Well, and let's back up just a little bit, sure. if that's all right. The reason I joined the Gay Recreational Softball League uh, is referred to as the Hotlanta League. The reason I joined was to prove to myself that not only could I do it physically, but that I could also do it mentally. Um, and I thought this was a great idea, not only for myself, but also thinking outside of the box. It was a huge pool of individuals that I could talk to about my CASA program. Um, Hotlanta League is the second largest gay softball league in the United States. This league had team members from every metro program, had people that worked uh, throughout all of Atlanta. And again, I'm thinking not only can I possibly recruit volunteers, but I might can recruit sponsors. I might be able to recruit donors. Or if we needed some type of service, there might be someone out there that could connect us to somebody. And I'll be honest, I didn't do it just for my program. I did it for all of the CASA programs throughout Atlanta. Because there are no residency requirements for CASA. It's a national organization. And some of their biggest things are no residency requirements. So in other words, you could work in one county or live in one county and volunteer in another. So it just depended on what your schedule was or what your preference was. Um, so yeah, we were fully active. Again, me thinking I'm going to have this chance to promote especially male volunteers. And for any of you that are familiar with CASA, that's one of the biggest pro uh, problems the national organization has is, cre is promoting male volunteers. Well, the Hot Atlanta Softball League is predominantly male. Made simple sense to me. I'm <laughs> thinking, hey, I should get, you know, a pat on the back for this. Absolutely. But instead of getting a pat on the back, you got audited. Um, That's us, when my life changed. Tell us what happened so uh, I, in I April. Joined in January uh, of 2013. And late March, very early April, I get hit with an audit. I'd been with the county for over 10 years, had never been audited. Specifically, the money and the audit that they were looking at was not county funds. It came in from a separate funding source. It never passed through county finance. There were never any regulations or requirements on that money. It belonged to my 501c3, the Friends of Clayton County CASA. And they approved every single activity I did with those funds, including recruitment, training efforts, uh, retention efforts. Because for those that don't know about trying to manage a volunteer program, it's difficult. You've got to keep those volunteers wanting to come back, especially when the work they do is difficult. And trust me, if you haven't sat in a courtroom hearing a case with child abuse and neglect, you know, you might have that opportunity given the audience we're facing at some point. It's difficult, especially for a lay person that isn't used to or familiar with all of the laws. But to see that child sometimes bruised, banged up, to see photographs, to see that child sit in a courtroom crying because either whether they were abused by mommy, she was taken away from me, or I don't want to go back to mommy. I mean, the emotion level is just off the chain. So it's, it's, it's a process that, again, I'm thinking, we're, we're pulling in all of these good people mm -hmm. that can expand and help us, which it did. It, it helped us achieve 100% service to every child that came into state care and custody. So your world is all of a sudden sort of turned upside down. There are articles in the newspaper um, uh, asserting that you've misused CASA funds, 
never mind that an auditor uh, later testified that you did not. Um, and in 2014, well actually, no, let's go back. So then June, so that just six months after you join this softball team, you go to work, you have your, your swipe card key, and, and what happened? I could not get in the building. Um, I could not get onto my floor of the juvenile court facility. I could not get in my office, so I had to go to my juvenile court director's office, who was the one years ago that had said, yeah, I knew you were gay, uh, and I had to find out what was going on. Why can't I access anything? You and didn't know sort of right immediately? You didn't know that? You were being fired, or what, what was going through your mind? I was clueless. Okay. So they gave me a temporary card to use to access my floor and my office, and within minutes of me entering my office, my juvenile court director showed up with an envelope that said, you are effective immediately placed on administrative leave. You are to leave the property immediately and return at 4 o'clock p.m. and speak to me as to why I should not fire you. And you were escorted to your desk. And didn't you say something like, I know what this is about? And Well, that was at 4 o'clock. Okay. Yes, I was, uh, I was escorted from my desk I see. out of the building. And when back. I came back in at 4 o'clock, uh, of course, my juvenile court director said, so tell me why I shouldn't fire you. And I said, I did nothing wrong, and I know what this is about. And he pushed a pink slip across the desk and said, you are being terminated, stated reason, conduct unbecoming a Clayton County employee. And I knew immediately that this is because of my sexual orientation. And I told him, I know what this is about. And his response to me was, this is not because you're gay. Hmm. Tell us a little bit about the press at the time. There was a ABC, didn't they do a piece or something? On that is correct. Yeah, what, what was the gist of that coverage? So I was, at that point, again, escorted off the property and I was allowed to gather my few personal belongings, but then escorted by uh, juvenile court staff off the property and found out the next day that the juvenile court judge had scheduled a court-wide meeting with all of the other employees to discuss the fact that I had decided to join a, a gay softball league that I had misspent county funds, which again, I did not. None of the money I ever spent was county funds. Um, and went through some of the other personnel facts about my situation, which I'm not an attorney and I'm not an HR person, but I mean, that came out in court. That's obviously an HR violation that my court, that the judge, and at that time had become the chief judge, was discussing my personal file and my record amongst the members of the juvenile court, roughly about 100 plus people in the room uh, listening to him bash me. I get, get a phone call that afternoon, you gotta turn on ABC. There's a news reporter at Clayton County Juvenile Court that is interviewing that particular judge and just totally bashed me. Um, again, stated I was spending county money to the effect of tens of thousands of dollars um, and that I was in Midtown, which I know you guys have a Midtown, I believe, in, in New York. Our Midtown, I'm not sure about yours, but ours has historically been referred to as a gay area of Atlanta but he made that point to continually say, spent, not only spending that money, but spending it in gay midtown, uh, taking my friends, ex-boyfriends, uh, taking people out to eat and drink on county funds that had nothing to do with mm -hmm. you know, working with the court. And not long after you leave midtown, you leave town, 
um, you move to DeKalb. <coughs> Why did you move? That is correct. After this process started, um, I did continue to play on the Hotlanta Softball League for two more seasons. Uh, I decided pretty soon after this to list my house for sale because I didn't feel comfortable. Um, my reputation had been shattered, and, and this is a community, very small, close-knit, that I had developed great relationships with. And mind you, one of my first things after I was wrongfully terminated is I applied for unemployment, and then I marched myself to the EEOC and filed a complaint. And I began getting nervous about my safety. The juvenile court administrator, the, the leadership of the court, the leadership of Clayton County, they were very well intertwined with Clayton County Sheriff's Department, Clayton County Jonesboro Department. I was literally afraid if I drove from my home to the, the grocery store around the corner that a cop would pull me over because that was kind of the backwoods uh, environment we had in that community. So yes, I moved, I finally was able to sell my home and I moved more into Atlanta uh, in what's called DeKalb County. It's a much closer metro county and I've been there since. And you then decide to sue. Before we talk about the suit itself, um, you told me that sort of up until this point, you had not been particularly kind of politically engaged. Um, in fact, you know, back in 2003, you were barely aware of Lawrence v. Texas, which made it unconstitutional to criminalize gay sex. Um, but now here you are sort of stepping into the fray. You're gonna sue. Tell us a little bit about this, this change in you, your decision to fight. Well, I'll be honest, when, when this happened to me, you know, I lost my income. I lo lost my source of income at a time I was still recovering from prostate cancer. COBRA was killing me. You know, the COBRA payments every month are insane. And yeah. from what I've heard, they've gone up much higher than what I was paying. And I went through savings. I, you know, I had a mortgage. I had car payment. You know, I had to eat. Um, I had to do some of the legal process, making you know payment for that. So, I mean, it started out as a devastating experience, and it, it sort of just snowballed mm -hmm. from there. And I'm sorry, can you repeat the last part of that? Yeah, just your decision to sort of what in you gave you this. You know, you're saying there was actually just a financial sort of you know necessity, but you also were becoming kind of politically engaged. Maybe you didn't know that at the time, but you were, by filing suit, you were entering a world that you really had sort of steered clear of before. Right. Um, again, I, I think I was so focused on what I needed to do to survive, to not lose my house, to not lose my, my car. Um, so I was, I was self-centered and self-focused on what, what do I need to do next. I, I couldn't find a legal firm at the time to represent me. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest responses I got from legal teams were, we don't sue or we don't fight county government or we're not gonna take <laughs> LGBTQ plus cases. Um, that's when it began to hit me. Okay, this is a little bigger than me. And I started thinking back and what hit me First and foremost was the Same-Sex Equality Act that got passed and Jim Ogrebethel. That was 2015, right? That when was you're, 2015. You're going through this. Yeah. That is correct. And see, I'm still in limbo in, in 2015. So from there, it did sort of, it sort of changed my mindset, obviously. But then I think I began to see more clearly and I don't know if you want me to jump ahead, but sure. there, there are so many things, and, and I'm not a politician either. I do now consider myself an activist, but you know, after our case in Washington, you know, the, um, the Gavin Grimm case about the bathrooms, 
uh, Bostock versus Clayton County impacted that. Um, since then, Olivia Hill, for those of you that are familiar with Olivia Hill's case, the, the Vanderbilt trans employee that was horribly discriminated against, um, that has impacted me. And thankfully, my case has helped impact her case. Um, I shared earlier today that um, Holden White, does anybody, is anybody familiar with Holden White? lives in Louisiana, and in 2021 was scammed by a dating site and met a guy that was interested in hooking up with him. Young man, uh, Holden, very young man. Holden agrees to do it, and unfortunately, the perpetrator uh, that scammed him basically kidnapped him tied him to a bed, and did extremely horrible things to him, including cutting his wrists, uh, beating him, strangling him, basically left him to die. But given his courage and his willingness to live, he somehow survived. And his family reached out to me and my partner and said, hey, can you send some words of encouragement to Holden? We don't know if he's going to make it through the weekend. Hmm. Well, before you are a person that people are turning to and your case is just now sort of getting going, take us to that. It's, it's 2015, really, when you filed suit, right? How did you find a lawyer, ultimately? It was through a series of referrals from, okay. from different legal firms. And fortunately, I did find one in Atlanta, Buckley Beal. And they took the case, and off we went. Uh, and initially, the case is dismissed, right, in 2016, 2017? That is correct. And, so, and then remarkably, in 2018, the Supreme Court um, decides that they're going to hear the case. They, they, um, they combined it with two other employment discrimination cases um, involving a gay man named Donald Zarda and a transgender woman named Amy Stevens. So tell me just, this must have been sort of initially surreal for you. Your case is now going to be heard by the Supreme Court. What was that like? It was, and it was also very humbling. Um, and to my understanding, Amy Stevens and Don Z Zarda, they both won in their circuits. Mm -hmm. My case was never heard in the 11th Circuit, which is Georgia, Florida, Alabama. and. The employers in the other two cases are the ones that appealed to the United States Supreme Court. And I was told that it's called um, circuit splitting, that you can't have one federal circuit say one thing and then two others say a, another. So of the, what, thousands and thousands, maybe 10,000 plus cases that get submitted to the United States Supreme Court, they take less than 1%. And they took ours. Mine was consolidated for purposes of oral arguments with the Don Zarda case, who was the skydiver. Mm -hmm. Again, sadly, he didn't make it to be there with us in, in Washington. The other was heard right after our case, Amy Stevens, who was the transgender funeral home director. But for the, for the purposes of the opinion, all three were consolidated, which really made it even more special for us that we had a cross-the-board win. So let's talk a little bit just about the legal question at the heart of your suit. So in 1964, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act, which prohibited discrimination owing to race, religion, ethnicity, and sex. Your suit asked the court whether discrimination because of sex encompassed sexual orientation and gender identity. And the court answers that it does. Uh, yes, it does. Justice Gorsuch, he writes in a in the 6-3 majority opinion, I'm going to quote, an employer who fires an individual for being homosexual or transgender fires that person for traits or actions it would not have questioned in members of a different sex. Sex plays a necessary and undisguisable role in the decision. Exactly what? Title VII of the Civil Rights Act forbids. So I'm curious, did you concern yourself with the legal argument in your suit? Did you 
Did you think about it, or was the suit for you really simply about righting a wrong? I would say probably more so righting a wrong. Again, I'm, I'm not an attorney, and, and I feel like I've learned a lot during this process, but uh, I turned that part over to my great legal team to, to guide me through that. I asked a lot of questions, and um, again, feel like I, I learned a lot. And, and I do know that, that we were saying from the beginning it does encompass sexual orientation and, and, and gender identity. It was the other, it was all three in employers that said no, it does not, that we, we had no business to even be in Washington. But uh, yeah, I was, I was focused on what I needed to do. And you were there for oral arguments, right? And you, you had a, a strong feeling that you were gonna win. Do you remember what that was based on? I was there, and let me tell you, that building is beautiful, and I do believe in what that building stands for, regardless of political boundaries. And fortunately, we had the opportunity days before oral arguments to have a tour, and we were shown where we would be sitting and kind of just a walk through of the process of the uh, United States Supreme Court. And so I was able to work out and work through those wow moments. Uh, and so the day of, I wasn't gonna show up all giddy and stuff that I'm standing here you know, at the, at the court. Uh, I will say that upon arrival, there was a unmarked package that had been delivered at some point early hours. On the front steps, the entire area had to be uh, evacuated. Mm -hmm. We were escorted very quickly into a side uh, secured entrance, which again just goes to speak to you know homophobia that this world still has. But yeah, being in that courtroom, listening to the conversations, listening to the questions, and getting to see Ruth, I tell you, that was <laughs> probably one of the highlights. And she may have been small in statute, is that the right word, her height? But what a giant when it comes to equality and equal rights, and she was absolutely amazing. But when we walked out, I was even more confident that day that equality would win. And I even told my legal team, I said, we've got this six to three. And I was asked, well, who are gonna be the two that no one's expecting? And I said, Gorsuch and Roberts. And hmm. I was well, right. There you go. <laughs> Amazing. I'll have just one or two final questions here, and then we'll turn it over to, to you. Um, so do you feel um, that your legacy, uh, the legacy of your case, is secure? I've begun to wonder just how secure, um, given some of the ongoing political mess that's out there. Uh, our very own state of Georgia, our governor, Governor Kemp, just passed legislation allowing medical providers to turn away transgender children if they need medical care and the provider doesn't want to do it. Uh, DeSantis in Florida is expanding the Don't Say Gay from, I believe it went through third grade in the school system. Hmm. He's expanding it all the way to 12th grade. Uh, just before coming here to New York, received a call that the Human Rights Campaign is actively working on an emergency basis in the state of Montana because they're the legal system and the legislature in Montana is trying to pass legislation that will block Bostock versus Clayton County. So, you know, while I remain hopeful that these powerful decisions will remain effective, I think this just underscores the very fact that we have to work harder. I mean, there's obviously no room in this world for homophobia, and there is absolutely no need for any type of discrimination, regardless of what it is. I mean, let's look back to George Floyd. That was going on during the, the, the opinion on my case, and it has continued. 
So we just have to work harder to ensure that equality continues to win. Uh, last question from me. Um, what did your mom think of all this? Was she, was she proud? Was she, <laughs> she was horrified? Very proud. <laughs> was she, what was she thinking? She's proud. Yes, she's very proud, as is my, my family. And, That's wonderful. And my partner who's here with us today. That's wonderful. And who's been with me from the beginning of this, by mm. the way. Um, do folks have questions? Yeah. There's a question over here. Oh. To see if, yeah. In, in assembling your legal team, how did you identify, so it sounded like a difficult process, how did, who, who helped, who coordinated? You mentioned the law firm in Atlanta. Yeah, it's a, it's a very large law firm, and they act, the firm actually assigned two lead attorneys to my case, and they, they worked in tandem on this. Uh, one of the two ended up getting a really nice job position out in Seattle at, with the, the uh, Attorney General for Seattle. And so he ended up leaving after we had been to Washington. He wasn't with us when we got the decision. But then uh, actually one of the partners at uh, Buckley Beal, Mr. Buckley, stepped in to fill that role. Because it took <laughs> you know, a lot of manpower on their part. We also hired a communication team, which I was very grateful for. They brought in media uh, trainers, so I, I spent a month probably doing media school. They, prior to us going to Washington, they were in my home, like a crew of eight. Uh, they handled all of the interviews, which was roughly 133 before Washington. Then after Washington, you know, the pandemic hit, and all of a sudden, they weren't physically present, but we had computers set up in the dining room, and so everything was virtual, and there were about another 144 interviews after we had been to, to Washington. So it, it's taken a lot of people. And then, like I said, my strong family and circle of friends and my partner that have been there supportive. So without all of these people in place, I, I have no doubt I wouldn't have made it to this point. And there was a happy postscript for you with the case that after the Supreme Court ruling, your case was remanded back to a federal court in Georgia, right? And, and you won. You had a nice settlement. Well, we, we did win. Uh, yes, the case was remanded back. And we knew all along that Clayton County did not want to take this to court. But they drug it out for nine years. And can you just imagine the legal fees and all the expenses, court fees, uh, deposition fees, uh, the toll has been tremendous. But we did go through deposition and we had agreed that we would pass yes. this. This was the shirt of controversy. God, this is funny. Um, the county considered this offensive. So I will hold it up. It's got my team logo from when I joined the league, Honey Badgers, and it's just a paw. And on the back, it says, thanks to our proud sponsors. Now, the county program I ran through non-county money provided the sponsorship and got right here in the middle. You know, most people would think, oh, this is a really nice T-shirt. The hearing judge at the Department of Labor agreed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The juvenile court director at the time, he just sat there, uh, 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 I honestly think the other people in this did not even take the time to look at it, but literally this has been evidence for nine years. <laughs> so if you'd like to take a look and just kind of pass it around a little bit. <laughs> hmm. And then get this, um, during deposition, one of the county attorneys, when we were wrapping up, and as the recorders were shutting down everything, he told one of my attorneys that he wanted to try that shirt on, that it would help him relive his youth. And again, I've, I've been through a lot of training, and my attorneys and my communication team <laughs> have given me lots of great instruction, most of which was keep your mouth shut unless you're asked a question. And then we will make sure you know what to say and how to say it. 
So trust me when I say I had to bite my tongue <laughs> when that attorney said that to me. And what I wanted to tell him was number one, that's my personal property that was taken in as evidence. And number two, I'd best not catch you trying that shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> I just found it offensive, especially since the county found this very respectful t-shirt that recognized people that were donating money to help a, a softball team. Um, yeah, it, it was difficult to sit there with that. Any other questions? Um, so I, I'm one of the professors here. Not all of the relationships between uh, clients and lawyers go as smoothly as it sounds like the relationship you have with your lawyers, particularly in cases like this that change the law in such a positive direction. We have a bunch of students in the room who I think are hoping to go into the kind of litigation that it sounds like some of your lawyers were able to do on your behalf in this case. I wonder if you have any advice for them about how they can be the kind of lawyers to support clients like you in situations like this so that they can have as harmonious a relationship as it sounds like you were able to enjoy with your lawyers of this really important case? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, what I would recommend, number one, listen to your clients. You know, give them an opportunity to tell their story and to talk to you. And, and secondly, then, I guess, have an open mind. Um, a lot of it, I think, may fall back on personality. And my two main attorneys have great personalities, and we just seem to, to gel and, and get along. Now, trust me, there were a couple of times that I was frustrated, and I would like hang up the phone and go, Rrr! but uh, <laughs> but you know they they have a job to do, and they were being paid to do it. Um, again, I I was financially in debt because yes, we did as we were talking about a minute ago, Clayton County did finally say, let's sit down at mediation and talk. Let's, let's don't let this go to court. Because they knew they were going to lose. The evidence was squarely against them. Uh, I mean, those of you looking at the shirt or have seen it, I mean, again, that's, that's one of their big things is this T-shirt. <laughs> but uh, in the audit, and the, their own auditor said, there's no misuse of money here. This money didn't even belong to Clayton County. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, just I think having that, creating and developing that relationship and, and having an open mind and certainly having the ability to listen. I was totally shocked. But, but here's the kicker, and it's my belief, even I had mentioned the, the judge that became the chief judge that yeah. ultimately ended up having the final say in, in my termination. He knew I was gay. I was being invited to his home. But what, what became apparent is it's fine that you're gay and you're here at home in Clayton County where we can control this but you're out in Midtown Atlanta, and you're, you're trying to recruit gay men to come into our county, you know, to work with our children, you know. And face it, the, ch the children in this, they're the biggest victim because I've kept an eye on Clayton County Casa. They're not serving 100% of their children anymore. They were down to 50, 40% again. And it's all because of that mindset. And didn't that judge several times mention in, in a sort of work diary um, that you were gay? He mentioned in one entry that I was gay eight times. That is correct. Yeah. Well after he had met me and knew of my sexual orientation. And it was, I, re I regret having to make the decision to fire Gerald Bostock. He's gay. So even though, you know, we used to go to dinner with him, he's gay. I mean, it was just, 
eight times in one entry shortly before the decision was to fire mm -hmm. with the reason conduct on becoming a Clayton County employee. And, you know, I say that the child was the victim, and I still stand by that. But there were also adult victims in this, too, because what about all of the people that I had been talking to that wanted to come into the county and volunteer? The message that Clayton County sent to them is, you're not welcome in our community. I was welcome as long as I kept my mouth shut, you know, as far as my sexual sexuality within the boundaries of my county. But yeah, once you cross that county line, even though with CASA there's no restriction on where you go or who you recruit or where you volunteer at, and wasn't good enough for, for this uh, body of leadership. Yeah. Question? Well, when you were fired, your reputation was totally destroyed. And then you had that whole time with court cases, the Supreme Court, back to the district court, and afterwards. What was your employment situation during that period? It took me a while to find a job. And thank you for asking that. I have a diary of all of the interview and all of the job applications I submitted after being terminated, I couldn't get a single interview, especially if it was directly related to a child advocacy program or agency. I mean, I was blacklisted. Uh, so yeah, it took me a while, and I have a very dear friend that worked at Neiman Marcus in Atlanta, and he ended up getting me a job as part of their optimal support team, which in a nutshell, it's a group of people that they look for internal theft. And when I'm talking internal theft, it's not that like employees are stealing merchandise, they hide it for their clients and they don't take it out of the system. So then if another store needs it or another customer wants it, it can't be produced and the store has to list it as, as a loss. So I was hired and I committed to do that for a year, making more than not even half of the salary I was making. It was almost a, probably a quarter of my salary. I stayed there a year and then fortunately had the opportunity to apply for a position with uh, our state psychiatric hospital in Atlanta and accepted a job there. And I've now been there for going on nine years you know, right after my, I had served my year with Neiman Marcus. Still not making the same salary because the state, I'm a state employee for Georgia and they don't pay squad either, just like they don't pay <laughs> social workers. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Are you aware of any chilling effect on other county or municipal employees uh, following your termination? Were there other members of the LGBT community in the workforce who either got fired or quit or people who were possibly come to, the, come to work for the county but backed away because of that type of environment? Not for Clayton County because I think the message that that county sent was very loud and clear. And for anyone interested in coming in that I knew, they obviously did not. And a lot of the people that from the league that I recruited to volunteer of course, they immediately said, I'm not coming to, to do your volunteer work. I do have a dear friend that got married later that summer, and when his employer found out he, he married a male, he was fired. You can be married on Sunday, fired for it in the state of Georgia, on Monday. Yeah. Now, can you talk about your feelings about the courts? Obviously, you were well served, ultimately, by the Supreme Court's decision, but how did you feel about the courts and how they treated you throughout? Do you feel like they treated you well, that you were heard, that you know, your story was sort of well represented or you know, understood by the judges that heard, heard your case? Well, obviously my feelings are intense as far as the uh, juvenile court services in Clayton County. I, I will admit I was very frustrated with the 11th Circuit for not even giving me my day in court. Uh, you know, from the beginning, all I wanted was to paint my own portrait. For me to be the one to tell the story and say, this is what happened. Uh, but I didn't have that opportunity. And while I was being restricted um, 
the EEOC directed me to not speak to anybody with the county, to not speak to anybody, anyone in the press, to not even talk with family or friends, to anybody that had any connection to Clayton County that I was hands off. Um, so Clayton County didn't have that same thing. And I jokingly have said throughout this process, especially that chief judge, you know, he had diarrhea of the mouth and was given permission to, to have that. So when the case got remanded back, then that's when I was able to start really painting my own portrait. Um, and after the opinion, you know, in, in June of 2020. The 11th Circuit still didn't want it back, is what I was told, but... Uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, with cases like this that have such a great potential for generating serious change at the Supreme Court level, it seems like there's often a lot of strategizing or, um, yeah, sort of legal questioning about whether this is the right case to bring or whether this will have the right impact. Um, but as someone who you know just wants to have you know have their case resolved in a just way, I'm curious if that had any bearing on you or if you were aware of any of the sort of impersonal kind of calculating parts of this process. Well, again, I don't think so quite so much in the beginning, but then yes, as it kind of came together, then it it was very clear that you know number one, it was not just about me, and yes, it is a very big legal system. And there are a lot of hoops to, to jump through. And again, I, I, I hope I learned a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's a lot. And the average person, especially within the gay community, they're afraid of it. And because of that, they don't step forward. I've recently spoken to someone that feels like she was uh, discriminated against, but just said, we don't have the finances. We just don't have the courage to co go public and basically said, after watching you suffer through this for nine years, yeah, we've decided I'm just going to find another job and quit. Julie? Can I ask a flip side to my friend's question? You started by saying how you were not someone who waved the banner and marched, and you later identified as now you're an activist. How did being at the center of this legal case change your perception of kind of activism? what activism is needed for and what the courts can never achieve? How did your views change as you were the center of this? Well, let me be clear. I didn't ask for any of this. You know, kind of like the kids I represented, they just sort of found themselves in that chaotic child welfare system. And I didn't want any of this. I didn't ask for it. But then through the process, I realized somebody needs to stand up. Somebody has got to become the activist. Uh, because there's so much work that still needs to be done. And then trust me, if you had to talk to Holden White's parents when they, they asked us to send a brief video with words of encouragement, it took us almost an hour to do that, which was probably a five minute clip, but I got so emotional, it was difficult. So that, that's what pushes me. Um, I do hang a rainbow flag on our home during Pride Month, it doesn't stay up year-round. Um, I don't have stuff all over my vehicle. Um, and you're working, you still have a job that has nothing to do with this now. I mean, you're a mental health correct counselor. I'm not making the difference in the lives of children, but I'm hopefully making a difference in the lives of adults in the mental health field. Yeah. Um, this has been fascinating, and one reason it's been fascinating is that as someone who studies That's a great question. Uh, 
for most people that know me, um, they know that if, if you knock me down, I'm not going to stay down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up swinging, and I'm, I'm going to respond accordingly. Um, and I, I honestly believe I would have because, again, after seeing how the county maliciously tried to destroy my reputation and all the hard work that, that I had done. And it wasn't just me. I pulled together a good team of people that, that helped me. So I'm not bragging that it was all Gerald that did this. But I was able to pull together those people to make it happen. So I, I, I think, yes, I would have continued the fight because I go back to, I want to paint my own portrait. I'm not going to allow a homophobic judge and a homophobic county do that without pulling out the paintbrush and doing it myself. Well, we're all glad that you did. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.